Good evening, everyone. Always good to be in the Lord's house. And we just pray that the Lord will bless his word to our hearts and glorify his name. Our subject for tonight is teaching by contrast. Both Pastor Frank and I will be taking our topics from the Sermon on the Mount and we will both be sharing about five topics each. Actually, you could probably find about 40 contrasts in the Sermon on the Mount. But teaching by contrast is a very important ingredient when it comes to homiletics. Homiletics is uh, sermon preparation. And it is very important that we present both sides of any subject matter. We just do one side, then, you know, that's an imbalance and it's not, the, it's not the truth. In the Old Testament, the Levites were assigned the teaching ministry, and um, they were to make clear what God accepts and what God does not accept. And so just beginning in Leviticus 10.10, 10, Leviticus 10.10, 10, They had to make abundantly clear to God's people the left from the right. And it says in verse 10, And that ye may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. And that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord hath spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. And this is repeated again in Ezekiel and Malachi and other places. But let's look at another verse in Ezekiel, this is concerning the sons of Zadok. They were the faithful ministers. And it says in Ezekiel 44, 23, And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. So they were to make a difference between the holy and the profane. And the only way that we can make a difference between the holy and the profane is to teach both sides, the positive and the negative. If you go right, you'll be blessed. If you go left, you'll be cursed. And so as ministers, of course, we have to preach both sides of the coin. So when Israel entered into the promised land, six Tribes, actually the leadership from six tribes went up on Mount Gerizim and they were going to pronounce the blessings of keeping the law. And then the eldership from six other tribes went up on Mount Ebal and they pronounced the cursings of the law. So if you do this, you'll be blessed. If you do this, if you don't do this, you'll experience the curse. So... To preach God's blessing without the other side is a false balance, isn't it? We just preach the prosperity message. One of today's very popular ministers uh, claims that he never preaches on sin. That is a false balance, isn't it? And um, the scripture calls that an abomination. A false balance is an abomination with God. That's Proverbs 11. One, in fact, uh, if you go through the book of Proverbs, it's all contrast, isn't it? Between wise son, foolish son, the virtuous woman, the harlot. And in fact, the other day, I, I just happened to be looking at Proverbs chapter 14, and it looked like every verse in chapter 14 was a contrast Foolish woman, a wise woman builds her house. Foolish woman plucks it down. Uh, True witness, you know, a faithful witness uh, will not lie. False witness, you know, will utter lies. And all the way through, every verse almost is a contrast. One side and the other side. Book of James is also good for contrasts. The rich and the poor, the hearers and the doers. The blessing and cursing that comes out of one source, out of her mouth. 
God gives grace to the humble and resists the proud. I mean, everything is contrast. You have to preach both sides of the gospel. And, of course, Jesus was the greatest teacher, and the Sermon on the Mount is considered probably the greatest sermon ever preached. And so Jesus preached heaven and hell. Actually, if there was any imbalance in heaven and hell, Jesus preached more on hell, actually, than on heaven. And so there are mountaintops, there are valleys. We have to let people know. I mean, some preachers just preach mountaintop experiences, and you should always be up here and never prepare people for valleys. And uh, it's not the way it works. Well, let's go to our first topic here in the Sermon on the Mount. And our first topic is salt. So we're looking at Matthew 5.13. There are three chapters here to get the full Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But we're looking at salt in verse 13, 5.13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So salt in the word of God speaks of sincerity, conviction, genuineness, salt. And you could put Colossians 4, 6 down for a reference if you'd like to. And on the positive side, salt speaks of preservation. God's people are to be like salt. And God has sprinkled his people throughout the earth, in a sense, to keep the earth from going corrupt. Where God's people are, there should be preservation. And that's what we're here for, to bring preservation, keep the earth from going totally corrupt. Amen? That's what we're here for, right? But if the salt loses its savor, its efficacy, its salt, saltiness, what good is it? As Christians, um, we want our lives to convict the world of sin and righteousness. But when we compromise, then we lose our witness. And we no longer have the power to convict anybody. Do you believe that? When we compromise, we lose our witness. And I remember a story I heard some years ago about this fellow was a Christian, lukewarm probably would be the best way to describe him. And he was worked in a shop, but he he was one of the boys. He was sitting there listening to dirty jokes and probably sharing dirty jokes with everybody else in the shop. And then one day, one of his co-workers hurt himself seriously. He was dying on the shop floor. And, you know, this fellow, I think by his own words, said, I had no power to witness to the man or to pray for the man as he was dying there. And he died there in the shop because he had lost all salt saltness. I mean, he lost uh, any... Uh, he wasn't respected. Um, what he had to say meant nothing. And um, so when we lose our conviction, when we compromise, we have no power to witness anymore. Okay, I think we're all I can see that. Okay, let's look at the second one here, second um, comparison. And that is on the commandments. And we're looking at Matthew 5.19. Matthew 5.19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So here's a precept that is made quite clear. You might say, here's another evidence of genuineness, of true salt. You know, those who practice what they preach. You know, it's one thing. 
to to get up and preach, but you know, not to live it, to do and teach. And as ministers, we have to practice what we preach. And we want to uphold God's standard, but we want to live that standard as well. And those who do that are called great in heaven. Those who do not compromise God's word, those who teach, you know, God, uphold God's standards and live it, they're called great in heaven, in the kingdom of heaven. And that applies to lay people as well as the minister. I mean, we want to all practice what we preach. And remember, there are many distinctions in heaven, aren't there? Many distinctions. And the ministers, or lay people, for that matter, who compromise God's commandments, make allowances for God's people to compromise, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, which tells you that some of them will make it to heaven, but they're unrecognized in heaven. There are people that are known, and there are the unknowns in heaven. And I think even divorce is one area where many ministers have compromised. I mean, in these last days, we're going to see a lot of people come in like that. And we want to lead them to repentance. But many ministers today, they never touch a subject because they want a big church. And so they... They never touch it. But we want to uphold God's standards. Amen? And then, number three, sins of the spirit, sins of the flesh. We're looking at verses 27 and 28, Matthew 5. And it says, verse 27, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Moses, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery with her in his heart. So there's a big difference between uh, a sin of the flesh and a sin of the spirit. And a sin of the flesh is actually the the physical act, um, I mean, you would call that probably a first-degree sin. It's a act, person who actually commits the sin. Sin of, sin of the Spirit is a sin that has not been physically committed, but the thought or the meditation of it has been nurtured, and it's something that people... Uh, you know, think about and meditate upon in their mind. Um, maybe I haven't committed the sin, but I wanted to. And um, the new covenant provides grace for the second degree sins too, sins of the spirit. There's a d- difference between a first degree sin and a second degree sin. A difference between the actual act and the thought of the act. I mean, obviously. You don't go to prison for thinking murder. Uh, but, you know, God evaluates these kinds of things, and the New Testament demands higher standard. And there's grace, too, to overcome second-degree sins. Do you believe that? Yes. Amen. Okay, number four. Um, loving those who love you. Looking at, still in chapter 5, 46 and 47. For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? So the new covenant brings us to grip with motives, intents of the heart. And so this next example deals with everyday relationships, being nice, being friendly to those who love us uh, does not really merit any reward, um, saying hi to all of your friends and, and being nice to people that 
that love you. I mean, even the tax collectors for Rome do the same. They, they love their own family. They love their own. But do you realize that every single action down here is weighed? And there are rewards given for the slightest kindness that we bestow to others. A cup of cold water, thirsty, a smile, a pat on the back. Everything is recorded. And uh, we want to, we don't want to um, be robbed of a reward because we're not going out of our way to be nice to people that perhaps don't like us. Uh, The real reward is when we go out of the way We make it a point to be nice and friendly and say hi to people that really don't like us. Now, we all have had those kind of people in our lives, right? But can we go out of the way to try to be nice to them or do something for them? You know, when you do that, it kind of kindles warm thoughts in them towards you. And maybe they'll have a change of attitude towards you. But even if it doesn't happen, God sees it. That's the main thing. God sees it. And, you know, there's a reward when we are nice to people that aren't nice to us. How's that? And then number five, my last one here, is on recognition. And we're looking now into chapter six, verses one through four. And it begins, uh, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they might have glory of men. Verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. So, what are alms? Well, we're talking about charitable deeds, uh, acts of beneficence or being a benefactor to those in need. Now, we in the West um, are not confronted with people in real need. In fact, some of the welfare people in this country would be living like kings when you go into third world countries. Believe me, they would be living like kings. But in these other countries, third world countries, they don't provide for the poor. And so... You know, they're at the mercy of those who pass by. And, uh, you know, Jesus is saying, well, the hypocrites like to be seen for their good deeds, you know, and let everybody see what I'm doing here. Sound a trumpet, even when they made a big donation or something, you know, they had somebody actually play it, blow a trumpet so everybody could look over there and watch them, you know, drop the, the money in the box. But, um, you know, you see things even today where some rich person makes some donation. I see where uh, Bank America just donated a billion dollars for, you know, this racial unrest thing. Um, But people want to be known, you know. They make some big donation and they want to be recognized. Well, Jesus said, Okay, you have your reward then. You've got your recognition, you got your applause. Some ministers want their applause down here. They want to be clapped for every time they do something and everything they say. They've had their reward. But Jesus said that when we do a charitable act, not to, sometimes, you know, you can't help but do it in public. Do it in public. I mean, you're not trying to, but you're, You know, it just happens that way. But 
when we make when we do something in private and just we see somebody hurting and we want to help them and we do something god sees it and he rewards us he sees in secret but he rewards us openly for those things he sees those kinds of acts amen so Jesus is making, he's concerned with the heart, or I should say the motive of the giver. And so if we really want to be blessed, why? you know, we do these things in secret, and he rewards openly. Amen. I guess I'd rather receive my reward in heaven than to be recognized down here. How about you? Huh? Well... Now, Pastor Frank is up for the next five. Uh, did you stick with the five we thought, or did you come up with some different ones? Well, praise the Lord. Let's continue with our um, collection of contrasts from the Sermon on the Mount. And actually, to be honest with you, uh, I could spend the entire time on the first one because it really is um, a critical one. And the first one um, has to do with forgiveness. And I want to read Matthew 6, 14 and 15. In Matthew 6, 14 and 15, it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And the first thing I want to say about this is, uh, this is no metaphor. Uh, this is not a, an illustration to make a point. It's not a hyperbole. It's not an exaggeration. Um, it's, a, it's a literal statement. Um, it literally is true that God's uh, distribution of forgiveness to us is proportionate to our forgiveness towards others. Now, that's a tall order. Um, we are uh, an easily insulted creation, an easily insulted race, as is evident on our streets today. Uh, everyone is very sensitive, everyone's very touchy, but the reality is this, that uh, our acceptance before him, in many instances, um, is relative to our acceptance and forgiveness uh, of others. And sometimes, by the way, forgiveness is given even when forgiveness is not asked for. Uh, And it really is more for our benefit than it is for the other individual. Now, uh, it's a very tall order, but I just want to share something with you that that God spoke to me. We have all experienced insults. We've all experienced injuries. Sometimes they've been accidental, and other times they've been on purpose. Intentional injuries, intentional wounds. And yet, this scripture makes no uh, distinction between what's justified and what's not. The interesting thing about forgiveness is that you have to pay the price twice. You suffer the insult, and then you have to choose not to count the insult. So you pay the price twice. But when you put it in perspective, uh, as the Lord did for me on several occasions, uh, you know, I, I was saying to the Lord concerning a certain situation that I experienced personally, you know, I, uh, I cried out to God to help me. Because, you know, of, of a, a need. I understood this was not a metaphor. I understood that this is literal. And so I wanted, um, you know, to be released to forgive the offense of another, you know, that was intentional. And, uh, and we've all experienced it. There's, you know, everybody has things that happen throughout life. If you're a living human being today, then you've been offended. Intentionally, you've been insulted. So, I was seeking the Lord, and, and, and I don't want to go through all these verses because they're rather lengthy, but I do want to draw out of it the import of the verses. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 18, verse 24, and I'm not going to actually read it, but I just want to comment on it. Um, it's the story of the, uh, the steward who was called before the Lord and was asked to give account, and he couldn't pay his debt. And so the Lord frankly forgave him. He just simply said, he had compassion on him. He was going to throw him into prison. He had compassion on him. And he said, uh, I forgive you the debt. And we read through this story and we think, oh, yes, he was forgiven much. And, you know, he didn't forgive those uh, the one that was indebted to him. And, and that, you know, is the key to the story. But it's really rather deeper than that. 
Um, I was reading British theologian Adam Clark, who lived from 1762 to 1832, and this thought here of a thousand, ten thousand talents, rather, that was what this first man owed to his lord, to his master, was ten thousand talents. Ten thousand talents is, I'm going to read directly from uh, Adam Clark, the highest number known in Greek mathematical notation. It was the highest number known. It was the absolute highest number known in a mathematical uh, notation. You couldn't get a higher number. And in Adam Clark's day, which was the 17, 1800s, it translated, after he goes through all of the translations, whether it was a silver talent, whether it was a gold talent, and everything else, and so forth, uh, all commentators agree that it must have been a gold talent because that's how they, they likened their money. But at any rate, it was the sum of $67 million. And Adam Clark made a comment that that was the entire sum equal uh, to the British Empire. The entire asset of the British Empire was $67 million or thereabouts. And this was the amount that this man owed that was simply forgiven. Now, he wasn't a, a commoner. Obviously, we're talking about a lord himself. He was a man that was uh, of means. And so the debt was simply forgiven him. And then this same man goes out to somebody that owes him money and decides not to show him mercy. And I want to give you the translation of the amount of money that he owed. Now, you know, it says that he owed uh, the equivalent of, I'm giving you the translation for Clark here, he owed the equivalent of a British half penny. One half penny. One half penny is equal, uh, it's called half penny, there's it's no, no separation between, it's, it's one word, half penny is one half of a penny or one twenty-fourth of a shilling. And this, of course, is the time of Adam Clark, which translates to one four hundred and eightieth of a pound, of a British pound. That's the penury sum that this man owed to this um, the man that had been forgiven his $67 million debt. And so God began to deal with me along this line. And he said, you know, you, you come to the last portion, which I want to read in Matthew chapter 18, verse 32 to 35. It says, Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due him. And then it doesn't end there. So likewise... Shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses? So everything is context, right? If we have struggles with, with forgiveness, consider this parable. Consider the penalty that was paid for our sin. Consider the $67 million, pounds, whatever, uh, that we owed that God simply forgave without you know, uh, unconditionally just forgave because we asked for it. We asked for compassion. Now, that same burden of responsibility falls upon us to forgive those who offend us. Now, as I said, some people do things by accident. They don't even know that they're doing something and they, and they offend us and they, and they harm us. But this applies also to those who do it maliciously. And the importance is this. It's not really, it's not really even just a matter that, you know, God will forgive us our trespasses in heaven. It also increases our quality of life. Unforgiveness is a terrible burden to carry. It's an un, it's an un, it's a formidable burden to carry to always say, you know, as, as a pastor, I've been in my chambers on many occasions and, you know, counseling between a husband and a wife. And all of a sudden you hear something like this. You hear, well, 25 years ago you said this. And 30 years ago, you said that. Well, you've been carrying that around for 25 years? Well, that's a terrible burden. That's a terrible burden. And so forgiveness not only gives us acceptance in the eyes and the heart of God, it also liberates our own spirit. Now, there were, um, uh, you know, there were things that happened to me as I was growing up as a child. There's things that happened to everybody. And sometimes my siblings talk about the things that happened when we were growing up, and I'm like, yeah, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. And they say, well, you of all people should remember because you were the subject of it all. But I don't. I mean, it's a male pattern of forgetfulness, I guess. But it serves me well. You know, you don't want to carry that stuff. And, and even more important than carrying it, 
you know, unforgiveness will, it will have a direct impact on our eternity as well. So forgiveness. Remember the parable of the great debt that was forgiven us. And it should liberate us. It should free us to say, at least to say, oh God, I can't release this. Help me. At least to say that much. And then I believe that God will give us the ability to do that because God loves forgiveness. God loves to forgive and he loves the forgiving. The second one we want to look at has to do with investment. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 and 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, you will also be anchored to. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, we're not going to turn there, but it simply says, If ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, not the things which are below. I had uh, a father who used to say this to me um, continuously, and as a boy, I, a little boy, I, I don't know that I appreciated it, but as I grew older, I began to realize, oh, it's a, it's a golden truth as solid as the, uh, as the, uh, the golden rule. And that is this, that in the end, you get what you want. In the end, you get what you want. Now, you can imagine my father was saying it to me, not necessarily in a flattering way. In the end, you're going to do what you want to do anyway, boy. But, um, you know, in the end, we get what we want. And it's very important, important that we are sure of what it is that we are striving for because God gives to every creature what they desire. And it's important that we desire the right things. Do we desire the things of this earth? Are we looking for an increase of quality of life? Well, everybody would like a quality of life. That's a, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. The question is, what are you willing to pay to get it? Will you neglect the call? Will you forsake the call in order to get things of this world? I think some of the saddest stories that I ever hear are the stories of worldly entertainers who lusted for fame, applause, and fortune. And you hear the story, you know, you, you hear it in their obituaries when you hear it. You know, oh, they were, you know, they were raised in the church. They sang in the church choir. Oh, that person's father was a pastor. I'm thinking of two people in particular, you know. Uh, both of them came from full gospel churches, became entertainers, and both of them died of drug overdoses. How did that happen? Well, their treasure was the wrong treasure. One of them actually, one individual, a different individual, who actually, uh, if I mention his name, many here would know who I'm talking about. He's was one of the most profane comedians in my lifetime that I've ever heard. Uh, not that I've heard him, but that I've ever heard of. And, uh, you know, he was a Bible school graduate. A Bible school graduate. What happened? He began to fall in love with the wrong things. And so, you know, we are not to lay up treasures upon this earth. So much of mankind is spent, so much energy is burned up uh, trying to build an empire, trying to build a kingdom, trying to increase quality of life, trying to keep up with the Joneses. And in the end, you know, they're left with uh, a disaster. I guarantee you that not a single one of those entertainers ever thought that they would die of a drug overdose in their younger days. But they desired the wrong things. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. Now, now note it doesn't say that the Father doesn't love them. Don't mix that up. It doesn't say that the love of the Father doesn't love them. It says the things that the Father loves are not in them. The things that the Father loves are not in them. And we want to love the things that the Father loves. Number eight, in the the list of ten, number eight, a kingdom first mentality. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 to 33. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And this piggybacks on the last one we looked at concerning where is our treasure? What is it that we're pursuing? What is it that we're looking for? But the idea is this, um, that we should not be spending all of our time trying to build an empire, trying to build a kingdom, trying to have the nicest things going beyond our means in order to do so. 
the, the scriptures, uh, this was illustrated to me within the last uh, month, actually. I was looking out my back window, um, and, and, and I was watching a sparrow. Now, Becky had put some, uh, some bread out in the backyard because we had caught a bird in our house. Not my favorite thing in the whole world, but we caught a bird in our house, and we let it out, but it was too small to fly, so we wanted to feed it and make sure it didn't die out there until his mother found it, which the mother did the next day and fed the bird, and then they flew happily away. But the interesting thing happened when this piece of bread was out there. Uh, I shared this with you just recently, that this this bird, one, one of the birds, not necessarily the one that we caught, but a bird flew into our yard and swooped up a big piece of this bread and went over to a secret part of the, the yard and began to chew on it until it had enough, and then it flew away. And I was thinking... Well, that's a waste. He ate what he needed and, and then flew away. What about the rest of you? Go take it stored and put it in your nest or something. But birds don't do that. Of the billions of birds on the planet today, every single one of them eats the meal when they need to eat it. There's no storing. There's no barns. There's no you know uh, hibernation or anything like that. It's all eaten every single meal. And the point that God is making in this parable is that he provides a meal for them every single day. Billions of birds get fed by the hand of God every single day. And then the story ends this way. Are not you more important than these birds? So don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Seek the kingdom first and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added. Uh, I think I'm, my time is running away from me here, so I'm going to pick it up a little bit. <laughs> That's the problem with being long-witted. Let me just say this here. Concerning seeking righteousness, seeking the kingdom first, uh, David said this, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. You seek the kingdom first and God will take care of the rest. God will take care of the rest. Over the years we have seen people uh, uh, you know, fall short in their church attendance fall short in their giving, fall short in, in their uh, affection for the Lord, all of this in pursuit of things of this world. No, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and then all the other things that you need will be added. Uh, number nine is the narrow road. We are encouraged to travel the narrow path and not the broad one. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate. Just this word straight, is, it's got a, a strange spelling too, because it actually means narrow. Narrow is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Now there is a really important principle that's laid out for us here. And you know what it is? Truth usually does not reside in the masses. The right path usually does not reside with the masses. Majority rules is how the world works. Well, at least in a non-oppressed society, majority rules is how it works. But when you're talking about things that are relative to the kingdom, you know, the majority is usually wrong. You will find if you're pursuing a righteous life, if you're pursuing holiness in your life, if you're going to sell out for God, you're going to find that the crowd is going to be small. Now, that's not me saying it. That's what the scripture says. Narrow is the gate. Straight is the way. Very straight is the way. And right now, today, whether it's in the world or whether it's in the church, it is, um, it's faddish. The world is faddish. The church is faddish. The latest fad, the latest fad in worship the latest fad in doctrine, the latest fad in whatever. And all of a sudden, everybody goes running to it. And I say, take care. Be careful. The kingdom does not run on fads. Give me what's solid. Give me what's proven. Give me, give me you know, what has been uh, uh, tested and is failure-proof. And that's what I'll pursue. Sit back. Watch the fad play out. And you'll watch generally it burns out. Because God does not generally exist in fads and the masses. That's exactly what the scriptures say. If you'll be righteous, you'll have to take a stand. People will come in and say you're archaic. People come in and say you're outdated. People come in and say the gospel is different in 2020. It is not. It's the same foundation that it was 2,000 years ago. 
It was good for Ma and Pa. It's good enough for me. Um, that's not to say God's not doing new things. That's a cloak. Be careful about that. Oh, God's doing new things. Those old, preaching about sin, preaching about the cross, preaching about the blood. That's old. That's old. People don't understand that. That's outdated. Well, they better get used to it because that's how you make it into the kingdom. So narrow is the road. And if you're going to do what's right, and if you're going to keep the commandments, you're going to find yourself uh, from time to time losing companions who will not go that way. What, now, why is that the case, by the way? What, we say this, but why is it the case? It's because God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's ways are not our ways. They're higher. They're different. You know, man, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is death. And only God can reveal it, and only God, you know, can tell. I remember back in the 80s, uh, I'm getting to the 10th one here, and the 10th is going to be really quick. But, you know, in the 80s, I was um, I was working third shift, and so that afforded me the opportunity to come home and watch the morning shows, which I did at that time. Uh, and in the one morning show, I was particularly interested because they announced Billy Graham was going to be the guest. And I thought, well, this ought to be interesting. Let's see what Billy Graham has to say to Jane Pauley. And so uh, he's sitting down, and, and Jane Pauley begins to interview him, and it turns out that she is interviewing him concerning some Lifetime Achievement Award he just received. And she's all smiling, and she's like, I could see he's grim as he's sitting there. He's very uncomfortable. And as she says, uh, Dr. Reverend Billy Graham, she said, this must be a highlight of your life. You know, everybody has acknowledged your Lifetime Achievement. And he goes, not really. <laughs> and she said, are you saying this is a bad thing? He said, yeah, I'm saying it's a bad thing. He said, my job is to convict people of sin and teach them the way of righteousness. When they start giving me awards, I wonder if I'm doing my job. And she was staggered. She had no idea what to say after that. See, narrow is the way. We don't look for the accolades of the world. Who cares what they have to say? I mean, to a certain extent, you know, we want to to be upright in, in society. But I mean, if they're uh, uh, chastising us for the straight way, Chastise on. I'll take the heat. I don't have to have you like me. Well, I hope you like me. I mean, you like me, right? Okay. I just had to get that affirmation because I felt a little insecure. Um, <clears throat> the last one. The wise man and the foolish man. We're reading from Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him, unto, liken him unto a wise man which builded his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Well, this is not, this doesn't require a considerable amount of extrapolation. It's very obvious what's being said. It's not the hearers only who are justified, but it's the doers. And, you know, as somebody preached some time before, they said, do you ever notice it's not called the ten suggestions, but rather the ten commandments? <laughs> it's not the ten good ideas. It's the ten commandments. Because when God says a thing, he expects us to do it. You know, if we want to express our love to the Lord, it's not in in agreeing what he has to say. If we want his acceptance, it's in doing what he says. And so uh, James tells us in James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straight forth, uh, straight way forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Amen? Amen. So we just commit these, these little maxims from, uh, the Sermon Amount to you. God bless.